Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bram Europa event on populism and uh, elections in Europe. Today we have Max Ekström from the Department of Journalism, Media and Communication and Jonathan Paul from the Department of Political Science and the Center of European Research. Uh, Brennpunkt Europa is a student-led organization uh, at the University of Gothenburg and is supported by the Center of European Studies and the Center of European Research. Uh, we organize lunch lectures about current European events such as this. And today the topic is populism. As you all know, it's increasingly happening in Europe and globally. Brexit is happening. Donald Trump became the president of the United States. And there is much more happening in the French elections. So the Dutch election results show that it's possible to say no to the worst form of populism. What will happen in the French elections? Who knows? Let's listen to Max Ekström and Jonathan Pop. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and happy to talk about uh, populism. My research is primarily in political parties, so I've inserted parties between the populism and elections topic that I was told to speak about. And what I'm going to do today is primarily try to con condense and distill uh, three different papers that I'm working on with colleagues that are at least related to the question of, of populism. Uh, the first is by a collaborative research team called the Chapel Hill Expert Survey on the party on the positioning of political parties in Europe. And then the second two are uh, co-authored with Jan Robney, who's a colleague at Sciences Po that used to be uh, a postdoctoral researcher here at the Center for European Research. Uh, so again, just uh, speaking about some of the things that Boo talked about, the, the general context of this is that Populism is something that uh, people have been studying for quite some time now, right? Uh, populist parties have been researched in the European context since at least the 1980s. But recently there's been a spark and it's been driven by a number of, uh, of, of important uh, developments, politically speaking, starting with the economic recession of 2009. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of this, we had uh, austerity measures that were imposed to some extent by the European Union and some of the other international lenders. And you saw a rise of populist parties in Southern Europe predominantly on the economic left. The spike in refugees and asylum applications that attended the uh, civil war in Syria has also been problematic, as has been the Brexit referendum and the uh, stridently anti-immigrant tone that was taken throughout the context of that debate. Uh, the US presidential election, in addition to Donald Trump, I think it's also important to keep in mind that Bernie Sanders, who was a very viable and, and uh, surprisingly challenging candidate uh, for the Democratic nomination in the primaries was striking a particularly populist tone through a lot of uh, the, that campaign. And then, as we mentioned, we have a really crowded electoral calendar in 2017 with important elections in the Netherlands that took place, France, where the first presidential uh, round is coming up very soon, and then Germany in the fall. So these are core EU member states, all of which feature, at least to some extent, populist parties. You've got Wilders in the PVV in the Netherlands, uh, Marine Le Pen, and the Front National in France, and then the existence of this uh, Alternative for Deutschland party in Germany that was somewhat unthinkable so, so a couple of years ago. And then finally, I think it's also important to keep in mind that we've got these broader concerns about a potential illiberal democratic turn in EU member states like Hungary and Poland. We don't need to look too much further for examples of this than the recent legislation that was uh, passed in the Hungarian parliament that. Uh, calls into question the viability of the Central European University, potentially. Right, so, so very uh, important things that are happening uh, in the current context. So one of the things I really want to take away from this talk, if nothing else, is that it's important to define our concepts. And I think populism is one of these things that is uh, slippery, very difficult to pin down. And you find a lot more disagreement about it the further you look in terms of what it is. Recently, Bonakowski and Gidron had an article in the APSA Comparative Politics newsletter that tries to highlight some of the, some of the similarities that, that are here. And it's a form of politics predicated on a moral distinction between corrupt elites and the virtuous people, with the latter viewed as the sole legitimate source of political power. Right? And I think in particular, I want to highlight this idea of the corrupt elites, because you see that in a variety of 
representations of what populism might be, be it a strategy of political mobilization, which features an unmediated relationship between leaders and supporters. Think about Donald Trump and his Twitter account, right? He doesn't want to go through the conventional media. He wants to have that direct con conversation. Importantly, it's also what Kaus Muda has referred to as a thin ideology, which means that in and of itself, it doesn't give you a lot of content in terms of what type of proposals you would want to see in ter uh, as far as society's uh, answers to problems. It needs to be grafted onto or applied to other ideas like socialism or nationalism. And importantly for our, our purposes, it can be either left or right. Uh, I think we, we have a tendency to, to focus on particular flavors of it, but it's important to know that populism in and of itself is not uh, ideologically uh, full, so to speak. Right? And then finally, it's been thought of as a form of political discourse. And in this, it's important to keep in mind that it's not necessarily exclusively the province of marginal actors on the political spectrum. Mainstream parties and major political parties can adopt populist discourse potentially. Right? You see this to some extent, as I said before, with Fidesz and, and Hungary, and potentially uh, people have brought up the idea that Mark Rutte, the prime minister in the Netherlands, when he said, when he published this newspaper uh, advertisement that suggested that people should either act normal or leave the Netherlands, right? that's potentially adopting some of the same kind of populist discourse that we're more likely to, to, to attribute to marginal actors. So in terms of how we go about measuring populism, as I mentioned before, the Chapel Hill Expert Survey is something that I've worked with for a while. And here's where we try to get an understanding of where the political parties of Europe stand on a variety of political issues. And two of the new questions we introduced uh, this most recent year were on the salience of anti-establishment and anti-elite rhetoric. Think about right, corrupt elites and then the salience of reducing political corruption. What we found really surprising was that the correlation between these variables was only 0.53. That certainly suggests that there's some relationship between the two concepts, but there's a lot of difference between the emphasis on political corruption and the emphasis on anti-elite sentiment. And I'll talk about that in more detail now. Later on, I'll talk a little bit more about voter support, which is based on European election studies data. This is aggregated up to the country level party-based salience of reducing corruption for political parties. And what I want you to notice is that there's a geographical pattern to it. The countries where it's the, the lowest salience, Norway, Switzerland, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, we know these people, right? Over here, you've got Slovenia, Greece, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Latvia. It seems like there are regional differences going on here between the salience of reducing political corruption. But I want you to keep in mind that this could be a spurious correlation. Just because we see this geographical pattern now, we need to do a little bit more sophisticated testing about how that works. Here, on the other hand, we're looking at the relationship between uh, anti-elite and anti-establishment rhetoric salience and party ideology as represented by party families. So groups of parties that have more in common with each other across countries than in terms of the differences within those countries. Right? And so here you see that the radical right and the radical left, parties on the extreme right and extreme left, seem to be the ones that emphasize the salience of anti-elite rhetoric more than others. So it suggests, at least in the bivariate kind of relationships that we're looking at here, that corruption seems to be at least to some extent about geography, whereas anti-elite salience, another component of populism, is increasingly, or it looks more like it might be about ideological positioning. Now I'm going to show you a few figures that are based on more sophisticated statistical tests of this. And I don't want you to get too hung up on too much of this, but looking at the anti-corruption here, what explains the anti-corruption salience for political parties, you'll notice that economic left-right positioning doesn't do a whole lot. Whereas looking over here at the quality of government, the perceived quality of the bureaucracy, and the impartiality of the various institutions matters quite a bit. So when you have high quality of government, you find lower anti-corruption salience, right? So it does seem to suggest that in this situation, you find more about the quality of the government that the, the, the countries seem to be experiencing than about the ideological positioning. Switching over to the anti-elite salience, it changes. And here you see that extreme left parties and culturally extremely traditional authoritarian and nationalistic parties are much more likely to emphasize anti-elite salience. You see much less of a relationship between low and high quality of government for this. You'll also notice that parties that are out of government, 
are more likely to emphasize uh, anti-elite salience, and that newer parties, this is party age here, you can see that younger parties are also more likely to emphasize anti-elite salience. This is relevant, and I know I'm running low on time, but uh, relevant for the performance of mainstream right and mainstream left parties relative to what Hobart and Tilly called in their article from 2016, challenger left and right parties and then challenger green parties. You'll see that the mainstream right and the mainstream left have been losing vote pretty considerably since the 2000s. And I would suggest that as much as we talk about populism and the interest in populism and things like this, the other side of the coin is equally important for us to understand, maybe even more so. We should think and really talk a lot about the plummeting of social democracy throughout most of Western Europe. And you see this is here on the mainstream left decline as well as on the mainstream right. Whereas these challenger parties, parties that have not been in government before or not often, are on the rise. But you can see that it's consolidated in the left and in the right. Not so much about the new greens. You know? How much time do I have? Five minutes? Jan and I, in some of our work, tried to break this down by worlds of welfare, which is based in the work of uh, Esping Anderson and the idea that there are different kinds of political economies. And what I really want to highlight here is that based on whether you're in a uh, southern form of political economy, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, there you see a rapid growth of support for the radical left, particularly after the economic crisis. Whereas if you are, for example, in a Scandinavian political economy, uh, which is Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and I think we throw in uh, Finland as well, even though that's not the right terminology, you see that that support has been growing as it relates to the radical right. So you have differentiated support for these types of populist parties depending on where you are regionally within Europe. This is in a two-dimensional space with economic left-right on the x-axis and then the social dimension on the Y. And you can see that the populist parties here, which I've highlighted by including diamonds in the southern political economies, like Podemos and Syriza, and to some extent the Five Star Movement in Italy, are both economically left, though less so here, but also culturally very liberal. Contrast this with the support or with the positioning of the populist parties in the Scandinavian countries, Danish People's Party, Finns Party, Sweden Democrats, where you see that they are relatively low. The defining feature is that they're very culturally conservative. The other thing I want to highlight here is that even though we refer to these parties as right, look at where they are in the economic dimension. They're relatively centrist, if not left, on their placement. And this is one of the other trends in the research on radical right parties of late, is that there's been a movement to the economic left. You can see this here over time in the Chapel Hill Expert Survey. Again, this is aggregated up to the party, uh, party family level. And you can see that the radical right party family in 1999 was an eight, so relatively right-leaning, economically speaking. Over time, they have actually passed the mainstream right and have become more centrist in their positioning. The argument here is that there's an attempt to appeal to working class voters that are alienated from social democratic parties, potentially. But when we try to explain the support for the radical right, it's not driven by economic positioning. It's still about the culture. It's still about immigration. What they're doing with the economic stuff is basically trying to not alienate anyone with it. Because you can see here that what we've done is we've created a variety of factors for voters. This is going to that European election study stuff. I'm going to end in just a second, Boo, I promise. And you see that there's not much relationship between economic positioning and support for radical right parties in Western Europe. However, look in Scandinavia and, and continental uh, uh, systems uh, of Europe, and you see that as you become more culturally conservative, there's a strong relationship to support. Uh, radical right parties. Here we tried to do a similar type of thing looking at the congruence. So the position of voters as opposed to the positions of parties on two major issues of what I want to focus on. You'll notice here that the radical right party family, the effect of redistribu re redistribution congruence, so similar positions on the question of how much the state should redistribute income, does not produce much of an effect in terms of predicting your vote for that type of a party. 
compared to conservatives, liberals, Christian Democrats, and socialists, where it does. But look over here on immigration congruence. Boy, does that matter. Right? So they're still voting for these parties based on those factors. Contrast this with the radical left, where you see that in Scandinavia and in continental uh, welfare states, it's primarily about economic leftism. But what's really fascinating to us is if you look down here at this figure, this is trouble paying bills, whether an individual reported having trouble paying their, paying their bills. And you see that for southern welfare states, it's not necessarily economic left-right position. It's how hard have you been hit by the crisis, essentially. Can you pay your bills? If not, you're going to be much more likely to support Tsaritsa, Podemos, et cetera. Yeah. So concluding. There are regional patterns to left-right variation versions of, uh, of populism. Radical right parties have moved to the left on the economic dimension, but it hasn't been clear. In legislation, they still often back right-wing policies. Even in their manifestos, there's frequently still references to cutting taxes and at the same time talking about other things that are, that are leftist. Voters are still choosing the radical right because of cultural attitudes and immigration congruence. Radical left voters in Southern Europe had trouble paying their bills, and those affected by the economic crisis, this is again getting back to the research of Sarah Hobalt and some of her colleagues, are much more likely to support challenger parties. Finally, this is a, I think it's the decline in the mainstream uh, party's success. Think back to that slide where they're all dropping down. It increases the chances of there being grand coalitions. Think about the Netherlands up until this most recent election. Think about the German uh, situation now where you have the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats together. This potentially plays into the narrative of the challenger populist that they're all the same. That the center left and the center right, essentially you get different flavors of the same cola-based soft drink, so to speak. Yeah. And so that the only ones that can really solve the problem are us. That's why I'm a little bit less optimistic than Boo about the, the outcome of the Netherlands election, right? Because I think, although Builders would have loved to come out on top totally, He's equally, if not, not, not equally, but still pretty happy about being the largest oppositional voice within the, within the uh, I can never say the parliament, right, in the uh, Netherlands. No, no, the, the name of the legislature. The Tweed, Tweed, uh, what? No, the par parliament building itself. What is it called? Lower, lower parliament in the Netherlands? Tweed something. That's it. Yeah, Twig Kevlar. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I have, and I apologize for running a little long. <laughs> so, will you help me to keep the time? Uh, you help me to keep the time. Um, uh, and perhaps uh, so. Can you help me find my my? Ah, okay. Okay, so thank you for inviting me to this uh, ni ni nice event. Uh, my presentation will be, um, be slightly different. I mean, it, it relates to this discussion about what, what is populism, but I will focus a bit more on, on, on the media and also uh, not present uh, uh, empiric much empirical data. Mm -hmm. We maybe come back to that in the, in the discussion, but but mainly give some kind of conceptual reflections on how we can understand, especially right-wing populism in, in relation to, to, the, to the media. Uh, okay, this, yeah, this is just a reminder for start. We have already had, had the reminder and background, but this relates to a, a project that we did where we compared uh, the relationships between right-wing po political populism and, and the media in uh, some different European countries during the uh, European Parliament election campaign in 2014. And, and uh, just a reminder that this is, was also part of the start of, of our growing interest in these issues, the fact that, that this uh, uh, election, uh, election result was kind of interpreted as an earthquake. Uh, and this metaphor was used in, in, in different European countries to really focus on this, uh, uh, the role of Euroscepticism and, and how the, the, the rise of political populism was also kind of related to uh, 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 discussions about crisis of legitimacy in, in, in Europe and, and political disrup disruptions, etc. Et so these are my four themes uh, uh, that I, I would like to present some reflections on. What is populism, the role of media, destabilizations, and also some, something about balancing of breaches and ma mainstreaming. <coughs> 
Um, okay, so, so the first to this issue about what, what, what is populism. I mean, th this is a really contested concept and, and, and obviously as, as already has been shown here, uh, uh, populist parties are not kind of uniform phenomena. They are really, re really, really different. Uh, these are, this is a slightly different but also overlapping way to kind of conceptualize, okay, what, what is the core of populism? It is the, obviously the appeal to the people and not only the appeal to the people as such, but, but researchers have also argued that it is this idea of an exclusive representation of the real people. So it's kind of a moral discourse also in this understanding of claiming to represent the real people, not different groups of people, not different interests, but kind of a, of, of a, of, of a more real group of real people. The anti-establishment discourse and the distrust of the political elite. The evocation, uh, evocation of crisis and politics of fear is also something that's quite often mentioned. And when it comes to the right-wing uh, populism, of course, nationalism and those nativism ideologies articulated in constructions of in-groups and out-groups, we, we and them and, 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 and so on. And here we have uh, in, in the bottom here just uh, two examples of, of the uh, huge number of different uh, definitions of populism. And I think this uh, one from uh, Müller, which was, he has also published, recently published in 2016, a book uh, with the title, what, what is Populism? Where he really emphasized this moral aspect and, and populism as, as, as uh, essentially a kind of anti-liberal and also anti-democratic uh, uh, discourse. Uh, the other is from Ruth Vodak's book on, book on, on right-wing populism, which, which is also a highly recommended uh, Politics of Fear, a highly recommended book, I, I, I would say, on, on right-wing populism, which based on comparison with, be, between different right-wing populist parties in, 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 in Europe. Uh, as a media scholar, not only as a media scholar, as, as I am, uh, I, I tend to, to also to, to kind of emphasize the, per, the, the more performative aspects of, of, of populism. And it kind of relates to this idea of a thin ideology. Uh, that this appeal to the people is basically related to different forms of symbolic representations and front stage Mediate, mediated performance. And I mean, just think about uh, Don, Donald Trump. Well, what we know about Donald Trump and his version of populism is, is very much about different forms of per performances in, 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 in the media, um, uh, including, of course, of course, Twitter. So this, this idea of uh, non-establishment, I mean, the anti-mainstream uh, uh, features of, of, of political populism is, I would argue, to a large extent, kind of embodied performative identities. It's, it's kind of something that has to do with doing being non-establishment. You know, if you think about Farage or, or, or Marine Le Pen, et cetera, et cetera, there are a number of examples how they kind of perform this doing being uh, non-establishment non in different forms of embodied styles. This also relates to the populist language. Uh, I mean, this idea of talking frank, frankly, saying the unsayable, spoken about what, what mainstream politics are supposed not to speak about, etc., etc., et being kind of different, and, and also a connect, this idea of connecting to ordinary people by being non-technocratic uh, and bureaucratic in the way we perform and speak the, the language, etc. Et so, uh, and performances are also important to note cultural practices. This idea that, that to, for populism to work, as for po politics in general to work, it must kind of hook into the, the, the national culture and the, the sentiments and, 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 and the, the, the stereotypes in a specific culture. And I, I think that is an interesting difference if you think about what is the difference, be, the difference between Farage uh, Jimmy Aukeson, uh, Donald Trump, Marine Le Pen, etc. So you can see that they kind of captivate and resonate different cultural stereotype identities in, in the different national uh, context. And also this issue about destabilization, I will come back to that. The role of the media is very complex, of course, and I, I, I cannot kind of present a lot of, 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 uh, of, of uh, uh, details about that, but, but uh, and, and obviously all politics today is mediatized in one way or another and is dependent on the successful uh, 
politics is dependent in one way or another on, on, on successful performances in, in, in the media. That's kind of self-evident. But um, there is an interesting discussion, and here I, have the, I, I mentioned a, 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 an article by, by Kramer, and there is a number of other uh, uh, studies about this. Interesting relationship between media populism and political populism. And, and people, a number of researchers have argued that me, media, especially tabloid media and, and political populists, they tend to share, uh, have something to, to, together. I mean, for example, this idea of the sensationalism, the emotionalization, personalization, the plain spoken discourse, critique of the establishment, and also this idea that you can, can, can recognize in the media that, that media and journalists tend to criticize politics for being too slow, uh, too bureaucratic. They ask for kind of quick solutions or complex, on complex social and political problems. Uh, uh, Cass Mudder, that, that Jonathan also referred to, uh, uh, has described media as uh, this relationship uh, in, in terms of friend and foo, which I, I think is interesting. And we can see that in our empirical studies, that, that the media, on the one hand, when it comes to the relationship to right-wing political populism, they tend to be kind of um, um, more critical in their analysis and more hostile in their interrogation and interviews with, with, with right-wing populist politicians. We can see that from different European countries. So this kind of more critical approach to them in, in mainstream journalism. On, on the other hand, uh, media and journalists, especially mainstream media, tend to present and create kind of favorable, five minutes, great, favorable platforms at the same time for, 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 for the po populists. And, uh, so this relationship is really, really complex. And this is just an example from the, from, uh, the, the kind of result from the, uh, the study we did on, on the European uh, Parliament election campaign in 2014, where you can see that in UK, the media t tended to present a favorable platform for, the, for, for, for um, uh, UKIP in the sense that they kind of actually mimic the political discourse, this radical questioning of political credi credibility of the establishment. So this idea of the establishment towards the, the, the ordinary people was actually also created in the media. Whilst in Sweden we have seen this, this uh, uh, creation of a favorite platforms in terms of the immigration debate, where you have all the time had, had uh, all mainstream politics on, politicians on one side of the table and the Swedish Democrats on the other side of the table frequently discussing this question about immigration, which is also the, the Swedish Democrats' profile issue. So in that sense, creating a, a, a favorable platform. Uh, another aspect that I think is very important to, to, to consider when we discuss what's going on here when it comes to populism is this idea of a form of destabilization of, of the, I say the mediated public political culture. I think we can argue for the political culture also in, in general, but that is, is, is a bigger, bigger issue. So when we think about the, the, the effects of political populism and, and relationships to the media, one issue is, of course, the, the effects in terms of the success for, for individual political parties and, polit and politicians in terms of, of, of uh, voter mobilization, etc. But we, I think we should also think about the effects on the general political culture of what, what's going on here. And to, to, to conceptualize it in terms of disruptions and destabilization would be, could, could be one way to, to understand it. And I think that, that we have um, destabilizations in, in, the, in, political, in the performances of political populism. I mean, think about Trump, for, for example, or Marine Le Pen, or, 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 or Wilner, or, 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 or someone. Uh, in terms of breaches, ruptures, and destabilization, first of the language and norms of conduct. Uh, I, I, I mentioned that pre in, in, in the beginning of my, my, my presentation here. The, bad, the idea of bad manner, populism as bad manner, uh, breaking the norms of mainstream political discourse. <laughs> also in terms of the genres and contracts of media reporting, the fact that, that we have populists kind of refusing to take part in the most institutionalized forms of media debate in election debate, saying that we don't participate, bypassing the, 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 the media that has essentially created this idea of, of, of the political mainstream. But the, poli the, the mainstreaming is, I would say, to a large extent also kind of a, a, a something that is created 
uh, collaboratively between mainstream journalists, mainstream media, and, and mainstream politicians. I mean, if you just think about how, how an ordinary uh, uh, election campaign plays out in, 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 in the media. Uh, Populists tend to bypass that, bypass it. but they also question the, the status and, and role of professional journalism. And actually also, the, I mean, for example, being really rude and hostile in, int in interviews, uh, talking about fake news, for example, I would say this is not, not because news have been more and more fake. It, it, that, that's a political discourse. It, 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 it's kind of a, a, crit a critique against and, 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 and a mocking of, of professional journalism and their idea of being impartial. So this idea of, 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 of norms of impartiality in professional journalism is, is, is questioned in a number of different ways, I would say, in, in, in contemporary political public. And basically also the questioning, in a, questioning of the norms of, of liberal democracy, for example, this idea of pluralism. I mean, this, the, this idea is saying that the, the, main, the main relationship, the main conflict in society is not between different interests or, or identity. It, it's between, basically between the, the, the establishment and the real people. That's kind of an anti-pluralist way of approaching uh, po politics. So uh, fi finally, do I have one minute or? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So finally, I think we should also, it's important to kind of reflect upon what's going on here in, in terms of, of the balancing between, on the one hand, the breaching of norms and of norms of conduct and, and the proper way of speaking, talking, and behaving in, in, in the political culture, and on the other hand, the mainstreaming of the populist parties. That happens when it comes to the performative style. You can, you can kind of analyze the, the, the behavior and the rhetorical style of the populist in terms of how they on the one hand uh, are kind of doing being different and anti-establishment, but also perform as respectable. I mean, think about Jimmy Åkesson in Sweden. He's not a real populist in this sense. In this sense. He, the, that part is really claiming to be respectable and, and, and being, being inside the mainstream, very different from Marine Le Pen, etc. We can think about that in terms of ideologies and, and re rhetoric. Marine Le Pen, for example, her strategy to detoxify and improve the party's repu reputation without actually changing the ideology. And finally, we can also analyze that in terms of the role of the media. Very interesting to think about how the role of the media maneuvering, on the one hand, positioning some of the kind of radical right-wing populist parties as deviant, really deviant, and on the other hand, take them into the, 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 the what, what what, what Daniel Hallin called the, le, le, the, the sphere of legitimate controversy, treating them as all other mainstream parties. And if, if you, I mean, if you think about the, the, the development of the Swedish Democrats, for example, they have absolutely been mainstreamed in the way that the media kind of welcomed them into very different from Golden Dawn, for example, the neo-Nazis party in, in Greece, which has a real, which, we, we, which is kind of reported as a really deviant uh, uh, phenomena in, in, in the Greek context. So I have to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you for your very interesting presentations. So I open the floor for any questions and discussion. Thank you very much, first of all, for your very interesting presentations. I would have two questions, one to both of you, one specifically to you, Jonathan, if I may. Uh, the first question is, um, in the Netherlands, Rutte claimed right after the election that he had captivated a form of positive populism. Um, would you say there's any such thing? And if so, do you also see that um, approach taken over by other mainstream uh, parties, particularly in government, I assume, but also in the opposition? Um, and the second point, on your last slide um, on the voters, do you also by any chance have data on what happens when actually one of these rather, uh, you know, left extreme or right extreme parties get actually into power, mainly regionally, because so far we don't have it in Europe that much nationally, do these voting behaviors change? Like, for example, the Five Star Movement has taken over with Rome and other commune um, elections, and also in France you have the Front National uh, governing some regions. So, this, do, would these these pictures that you showed us, these charts, would they change when they're actually in power? Would voters change? And if so, how? Uh, 
Yeah, those are both great questions. Uh, on the first, I think it's, it's something I really wanted to try to highlight that I didn't get a chance to discuss all that much. But this, he, he did say that this, they, they rejected the wrong kind of populism. And so that there's some kind of an idea that there's, there's the right kind of populism. And I think there's a pretty active debate going on about whether or not populism can be uh, normatively desirable. I read something recently by uh, Chantal Mouk that was making the case for uh, left populism. And there, I think it's important to define the terms again and the way people are thinking of these things. And I guess it depends also on your perspective. And from, from I guess, probably the, the bulk of, of, uh, of, of uh, society, the idea of a rejection of pluralism would seem to be the key as to whether or not it's uh, normatively desirable. And so if, if as, as, as Max was saying, if, if the idea is that there's just the pure people as opposed to the established corrupt elite, uh, I think that's potentially uh, quite dangerous. But if there is a recognition of there being some legitimate interest within society that's diversified, and that there's a way that that needs to be taken into account more, uh, more readily and more directly by those that are in power, perhaps there's some, some, some value in that sort of a thing. But I think that that's an interesting conversation and one that certainly needs to be put forward primarily within the context of this, okay, what are we talking about when we talk about populism? Um, with respect to the, what happens to the challenger parties once they get into power, uh, so Sarah Hobart, who I mentioned there, is developing this concept with uh, another scholar named Catherine de Vries. And they at least seem to suggest that these parties studiously try to avoid the, the governing. And I guess they point to the Danish People's Party as a pretty prime example of how they've been able to uh, really put forward their agenda in a lot of ways while avoiding responsibility for this, uh, for any of the things that come with governing. And then I guess if you think about the electoral prospects of the Finns and some of the other uh, other other ch formerly challenger parties, Syriza, right now, uh, it seems that once they get into government at the national level, at least there is a they suffer a consequence rather quickly in terms of electoral support. Uh, but I think that looking at it at the regional level would be really interesting, and I don't off the top of my head have any uh, immediate uh, ideas about how it would work there. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree on, on your reflection when it comes to this, uh, if there is a, a, a good, good form of pop populism. It's, it, it has to do with how you kind of define and appropriate the, the, the concept. And I mean, if you go to Müller, Müller, for example, in his book, What is Populism? He's really critical, but that is also related to the fact that he, he defined populism in, from this moral point of, of view and this kind of general questioning of, of, of of, demo, of liberal democracy. And so based on his book, you can on the one hand argue that th this is a too limited way of understanding populism. Populism is much more than this, this uh, 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 way of, of, of claiming to represent the kind of real homogeneous uh, 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 or even almost fictionalized version of, of the people, this anti-pluralism. Populism is much more. But on the other hand, you can also accept his definition and then argue that, that okay, uh, this is a critique against, uh, uh, populism also represents a critique against and the, the, this liberal democracy as the only way of understanding democracy. And if you go to the kind of leftist people, for example, Muff and, and, and Laclau, they, they, they have a much more positive version of, of populism. And I think uh, it's, it's a, it's a boring answer, but I, I think bo both is, is correct. It depends on how, how you define it. And it is obviously also important to, to realize that populism is also a reaction to something that is problematic. Not only, uh, I mean, uh, when, when it comes to the, 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 the leg legitimacy in, in the European Union and the relationship between kind of the political establishment and, and the citizen. It's not unproblematic. So, so in that sense, uh, it, 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 it is, um, I, I think it is uh, definitely important. But it's add. partly a conceptual di di discussion. I mean, just a recommendation in relation to this, read uh, uh, the, the former professor uh, uh, in, uh, in sociology here in Gothenburg, Jöran Terbon, and his uh, article in Aftonbladet, I think it was two, two days ago, was something from a very leftist po position he claimed that now it's, it can, can, he, he very much criticized this negative approach on populism. So, so 
Yeah. Kaus, Kaus Muda has a very nice turn of phrase about this, which you may have encountered already, but it's this idea that, uh, that uh, populism is a, democratic, a liberal democratic response to uh, non-democratic non liberalism, yeah. yeah. right? non-democratic <laughs> liberalism, yeah. right? Uh, but then I, I, Vera Farkas had had an op-ed in Pro Syndicate the other day where he was suggesting that the uh, that the establishment is the thing that's illiberal, right? Because they're imposing uh, uh, the will irrespective of the voice of people and these sorts of things, right? So uh, it's uh, it is very contested. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any question? I'm actually not that familiar with um, populism or the phenomenon, but I'm guessing that it's older than I don't know, 20 years. Uh, but why? I wonder if why now? What is happening? Is it only because of the crisis and um, I don't know, uh, increasing integration in the European Union, or why are we talking so much about it now? That's another question over there. Because the media that that they chose not to participate not completely right because they were excluded many of these parties and political reform from the start and then they started to turn out and common that uh, they did, didn't want to have with the mainstream media and the mainstream media <coughs> did not uh, want to have anything to do with them so they developed their own platform so now they grow so big so they don't need mainstream media and then when they finally get invited by many kind of force say no we don't <laughs> Want to uh, perform your premises? We we have our own channels. It's kind of the established media's own fault also because they were mm -hmm. kind of excluded uh, in the beginning, especially here in Sweden. I would say. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think at least in response to the first question of. Yeah, so there is actually, and I tried to highlight it, there's at least a 30-year tradition of research into this, right? Uh, and so it, it's not a new uh, research area, but it's definitely become a more popularized one. You can't be a political scientist today without having to give somebody your thoughts on, on populism. And I, I think this, this kind of overlaps with, with, the, with the other presentation. And I, it's this symbiotic relationship between the, the, the populist <laughs> politicians and the media. I think there, there really is a strong uh, incentive in terms of what, what seems to sell or what sort of narrative is, 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 is popular in terms of creating traction of, of, of ideas and information. And, and so there, was a, there seems to have been like this very strong idea that there's a kind of populist tide, right? First it was Brexit, or first it was you know, Southern Europe with the left populism, then Brexit, then the United States. And it's kind of metastasizing and it's also increasingly bringing into its orbit formally major actors instead of fringe uh, politicians for the most part. And so uh, it seemed, at least when I was following uh, my Twitter feed after the Dutch elections, it's mainly journalists and political scientists, almost this kind of palpable like, ah, when it wasn't PVV on the top because that was the narrative everyone is already ready to write about. And they had that <laughs> copy ready to file, so to speak, right? Uh, and, and, and so, um, I think, at least in part, it's it's been it's been it's gotten a lot of traction because it's a it's a it's a good story. Yeah. yeah if I just ref reflect a bit on 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 the other um, uh, uh, question here, I, I mean, I, I I agree that that you can also blame the the media and, and the media and professional journalism is a, is in a very kind of complex situation because. Uh, uh, the in increase of, of especially right-wing populism in countries like, like Sweden has, has kind of forced journalists also to reconsider some of, some, some of the kind of institutionalized ways of, of reporting. And, and it's very easy to report on kind of mainstream politics and right and, and, and wing and uh, right and left. And you have this uh, 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 kind of... Um, controversies be between pol politicians in this plural, pluralist, pluralist way. But on the other hand, you can also argue that they, the, the, the media tend to leave the, the citizens out from, from this. And, and, and the, the, the mainstream media has also reproduced this idea of the, the political establishment and, and, and being very distant from, 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 from citizens. And we have wonderful uh, examples from, from the news reporting on, on, on uh, 
UKIP and Nigel Farage in both in the Brexit campaign and, and this 2014 election campaign where he organized his campaign in a very different way. So you frequently see uh, Nigel Farage not speaking to people at, at the distance. As, I mean, if you think about the traditional way of, 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 of reporting and constructing political election campaigns in the media. But you see Farage, Farage on the pub with, with his fag cigarette uh, uh, speaking uh, very, very kind of relaxed and colloquial with, with ordinary people, etc., etc. Uh, so it's a, it's a totally different way of, 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 of kind of reporting and, 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 and vis visualizing this relationship between politics and, and politicians and, and, and ordinary people. So breaking this kind of standard format of, of news reporting, which created big problems for, for the journalists because they didn't know how to, de how to deal with him. So, Could I tack on one last comment about this? Uh, I, I think I was perhaps inadvertently overly flippant about it. It's not exclusive. I don't mean to suggest that there aren't real causes. Right? I think the economic crisis hit people quite hard. And particularly in Southern Europe, there is deep suffering, right? Uh, and then I think if you look at the growth of inequality, wealth inequality in the United States, but even in Sweden over the last uh, 10 to 15 to 20 years, I think there's a very strong and pronounced sense that there is not responsiveness from elected officials to the, uh, the, the difficulties that people are experiencing. And I think even more so on issues like uh, immigration or European integration, where there's been a disconnect between uh, citizen preferences and elite positions on European integration for years and years and years and years. And it may be that there's kind of a, a breaking point, so to speak, in terms of how much people are willing to sustain in the face of all of the economic hardships that's been uh, uh, pronounced in particular areas in particular. As we can see, there is much more to populism than what the media portrays. So thank you very much. And uh,